We continue our discussion of social class and poverty in America by looking at the issue of poverty in the United States, um, what its effects are upon the individuals who live in poverty and also some of the causes of poverty. First, a little discussion about what the definition of poverty is, I suppose, and this really is something that is interesting when you ask people about what poverty means to them. And uh, I suspect even in some of our discussion boards, I, I was reading and, and certainly read in other classes when individuals considered this question, well, that poverty is really a state of mind and that, you know, we didn't have much money when we grew up, but we never really considered ourselves poor. That's not really what we're talking about when we talk about poverty. If If an individual is poor, you know you're poor. And it isn't one of these things. It isn't just about not having money. It's really about not having access to any kind of power and any kind of the uh, opportunities to to uh, climb the social ladder that many individuals, most individuals say in the United States have. Poverty is something that is felt in the stomach and is, is felt when you uh, walk into the school and you're not uh, clothed nearly adequately compared to other children. And when you can't go on field trips and things because there isn't any money in the family to do that. That's what poverty is. Poverty is eating at the food bank occasionally and skipping meals because parents don't have the kind of income they need to feed you regularly. This is what poverty is. And the government defines poverty with a concept called the poverty line. And this is a, a, a feature that was created in 1965. And essentially it tries to define where a person is poor in American society. And what they do is they take the cost of a very low cost food budget. And this is something you'd have to be really pretty good at shopping in order to achieve and multiplying it by three. It doesn't take into account things like family size or the cost of living and, and those kinds of things. And while the, the, uh, the poverty level is increased uh, up or down a little bit here and there. You know, generally speaking, it, it remains pretty consistent. And many people have criticized the poverty line for being too low. And as it indicates here, you know, some people think it should be increased by as much as 50% of what it is. But I believe the last time um, I looked at this statistic, I think something like 18 or 19% of Americans live below the poverty line. And this is a very low line. Who are the poor? The poor usually uh, are, are likely, more likely to be a racial or ethnic minority than they are to be a member of the dominant majority. Uh, more likely to be elderly and maybe an elderly living in an ethnic community. You're more likely to be female or living in a female-led household. This is um, leads to the uh, concept of the feminization of poverty, where poverty really is so much of a woman's issue because most of the uh, homes in poverty are led by single mothers who are raising children and, and can't earn sufficient funds. If you're poor, you're also more likely to be a child. And in fact, most of the most of the individuals living poverty are children. And if you are a child living below the poverty line, you're more likely to be missing school. You're more likely to have a higher rate of criminal behavior. You're more likely to be a teenage parent. You're more likely to have health problems which also cause you to miss school or work more often which of course perpetuate the the whole problem also if you're poor you're more likely to live in a rural or inner city area not a suburban area the biggest subgroup that lives in poverty in the united states are children as i mentioned earlier and this is a a fact that is often lost upon those who argue against uh, well, things like cutting back, um, you know, uh, drug testing for people who are welfare recipients. You know, well, it seems like uh, it makes some sense, I suppose, if the adult in the home is using drugs um, to um, cut their welfare check without consideration being given to how that might impact the children who are living in that home, which will now have less money, less income. So, so this is really a, a subgroup that needs to be kept in mind as we talk about poverty, because when we talk about the poor, we focus upon that unemployed adult. That's a part of these, this uh, value system we have in America about individualism and the work ethic that cause us to, to do that. Um, now, despite the fact that one of the things about being an elderly living in an ethnic community, the group least likely to live in poverty are the elderly. And I suspect at this point, this has a lot to do with the existence of the social security system at this uh, in, in, in our times. Um, 
100 years ago, the elderly would have been among those who live in poverty a lot more than they do are today. We already talked about the feminization of poverty, and, and again, you know, this especially involves single parent households headed by women. Uh, when when um, an unmarried couple have children, almost always the woman raises the child, even if the man doesn't stick around to provide support. When there's a divorce, almost always the woman is the one who raises the child. And um, if there is um, spousal abuse, it's almost always the woman who has to leave the abuser with the children. And so um, very, very frequently um, then single parent households headed by women suffer poverty. Remember women on average earn 77%, 76% less than men in the workplace just with equal jobs. And so there's a number of different reasons why this is much more of a, of a woman's issue. Now, the more education you have, the least likely, the less likely you are rather to live in poverty. It's an important thing to keep in mind. And again, for, uh, almost, not quite half of the poor live in inner cities at this time. Here's a graphic that um, <clears throat> correlates the amount of education a woman has with the percentage of uh, women who have given birth are single and married. So let me say that again. It correlates an educational level with women who have given birth and whether they're single or married. And so you can see from this, obviously, if you have had a child as a female uh, with a graduate or professional degree, you are far more likely to be married um, and um, than, than not. Um, and with each step uh, up the educational ladder, let's say, it appears as though the more likely it is that you're to be married before you have um, before you have children or when you have children at least the uh, the flip side of the course of this is is that the less education one has the more likely you are to be a single mother here's a graphic that uh, looks at the patterns of poverty around the United States the highest poverty rates being green the least poverty rates being uh, that purple or blue color um, with the exception of New York and uh, uh, someone you know you really see poverty existing mostly in Appalachian states and uh, throughout the south the higher levels of poverty rates and um, of interest also is that um, Alaska is really rated among the states with the lowest poverty rates and I do find that to be um, interesting given that um, you know there are so many of the individuals that live in the villages of the west uh, certainly do not live well and I wonder if this isn't skewed by our income with the oil uh, oil industry So what are some of the dynamics engaged in or involved in poverty? There is this uh, concept, and we talked about this last week in terms of global um, poverty, uh, the culture of poverty concept that says that uh, that the poor have a unique value system that's, that uh, caused them to remain in poverty because of the way they adapt to the burdens of poverty. Um, now, there's been a great deal of criticism from social scientists of this, of this particular um, theory and I think actually it was advanced uh, uh, Patrick Daniel Moynihan did a study of, of poverty in America in the 1960s I believe it was for the Lyndon Johnson administration if I remember correctly and the, the report was very very uh, strongly criticized because of the fact that it talked about this culture of poverty and essentially blamed the poor for their own poverty um, Elliot Lebo and I think uh, you're reading one of his uh, articles uh, next week, I believe, you're going to read an article by Elliot Lebo. He indicates that um, the behaviors of the poor uh, are more driven by poverty than being the cause of the poverty. And uh, I just would encourage you to read his to read his article, understand this a little more. But again, Lebo studies suggest basically that we have it backwards, and that the behaviors aren't aren't the cause of the poverty; they're the result of the poverty. 
and in fact most poverty is very short-lived uh, many of the poor the individuals below the poverty line or that receive public assistance are m moving in and out of poverty sometimes they get work for periods of times and this is that uh, probably working class poor we're talking about here the working poor who can get jobs for a period of time and then maybe it's seasonal employment or it's very low paid employment without benefits and those jobs kind of come and go and so many individuals kind of move in and out of the out of the work out of the labor market basically um, and um, and so so a lot of poverty really is short-lived and and uh, most most of the people I think it's safe to say that uh, receive public assistance are, are struggling and trying to get off of public assistance and back into the uh, workforce once again but overall the the number of people who are poor remain relatively stable and, and this says something to you about how the economy may require a certain level of poverty to exist properly. I believe we have, or to function properly. I believe we've talked about this earlier, but um, most economic theories that I've seen suggest that in the United States, a 5% unemployment rate is necessary for the economy to function properly. If too many people are employed, wages go up and employers can no longer afford to employ people and then um, more people will, will um, lose their jobs and so with lower wages with that ready workforce out there that that pool of unemployed people wages stay down which which actually is one of the reasons we have poverty to begin with is because of low wages but wages stay down um, and uh, employers uh, can can um, gain better profit through their employment that way and so their businesses are more successful and so let me just say that the five percent unemployment rate this uh, this means five percent of people who are looking for work this does not include the people who aren't looking for work for whatever reason uh, the disabled or or those uh, individuals who maybe do receive public assistance who don't want to work and that's a much smaller majority is much smaller number than most people believe um, that uh, this 5% unemployment rate is necessary for the economy to function successfully. One in 20 people who want to have a job must be unemployed for our system to work properly. And so that's why this number of poor remain relatively stable. This idea that everyone can succeed is only true if you're among the 19 out of the 20 that have a job. And even then, you know, it's not necessarily true. So in 1996, the United States welfare system was restructured uh, under the Clinton administration um, and the maximum length of time that someone now can receive public assistance can collect welfare is five years. This has been a very controversial program and while indeed the welfare rolls have plummeted, I mean the amount of money that's going into the public assistance programs itself have gone down quite a bit uh, since that period of time. Uh, three out of five of those people who have come off of the welfare rolls um, are uh, still live in poverty uh, working at, at uh, jobs that really don't pay enough to to make ends meet oftentimes without the kind of health insurance that the, the individuals had when they were living on welfare um, and so sometimes these individuals wind up back on the welfare system at different times um, and, and one of the reasons is because sometimes for a parent it's a smarter decision to stay on welfare where you can get health insurance for your kids than it is to take a job that might pay as much or a little less and not have the kind of benefits that you need to give your kids proper health care. I mean it can be a it can be a responsible parental decision to stay on welfare in those situations. This, the, the issue of, of uh, individuals on public assistance and whether they deserve our help or not is really much more complex and deep uh, when you begin to look at this uh, a little more a little more thoroughly. There's a book that I use in my social welfare class. Uh, if you ever take that class with me, you'll read it. It's called um, So You Think I Drive a Cadillac, and it's written by an, a woman by the name of Karen Seacombe, S-E-C-C-O-M-B-E. -E. So You Think I Drive a Cadillac, and she she really kind of walks you through uh, many of these issues about women on public assistance and why they're there and what their existence is like. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's well worth reading if you're interested more in this topic. So we're going to close out with a few slides considering then why are people poor? There are really two competing points of view and we talked about this a little bit in the in the first half of this week's lecture. That is, is it a social structure cause or is it an individual cause? Um, 
some believe that the components of the social structure play a very strong contributing factor in the rate of poverty. Things like I was just talking about the, the need for a 5% unemployment rate for the economy to function effectively is one example of that. And that is just one example that involve many other kinds of things that contribute to, um, to the poverty rate. Um, the, the statistics show again, you know, as far as uh, being a racial or ethnic minority, that um, it's harder to get employment. Uh, you're more likely to get arrested. You're less likely to have good health care. Your income is likely to be lower. Those are all structural reasons for poverty as well. Another point of view about the reasons for poverty involve the characteristics of individuals. And this is what most of us tend to subscribe to. This is what we tend to think of when we answer this question. Well, people are lazy. People don't have enough education. People drink alcohol. People do drugs. Uh, people have too many children, you know, those kinds of things. All of those may be true to a certain extent uh, for some individuals that are poor. But by and large, the majority of the individuals that are are poor are there because of structural reasons, not because of individual choices or attitudes in their lives. Now, as a sociologist and hopefully as a social worker and human services worker, if you're heading into that field as well, you're going to focus upon the components in the social structure in looking for explanations for poverty. And, and those are the areas that you want to try to focus on as much as possible in understanding the dynamics of poverty. Um, most most individuals who really have studied this and, and understand this more will agree that the extremes of poverty and, and the inequalities that uh, have to be dealt with by the individuals who are poor uh, can't be explained because of the lack of individual effort alone. And it, it is really a much more complicated uh, issue than that. The main reasons for poverty exist in the structure of the social order itself. Institutional discrimination, as we had talked about some weeks back in the job market and among other areas, very deeply affects minorities and women more than any other group. Forced retirement, technological advances also contribute to creating poverty, particularly in regards to the elderly. In, in 1969, um, uh, during the Richard Nixon administration, the President's Commission on Income Maintenance Program said that our economic and social structure virtually guarantees poverty for millions of Americans. I believe this commission was actually appointed by Lyndon Johnson during his presidency, who was um, the president who declared the war on poverty when, uh, you know, in 1964, after he became president, uh, after John Kennedy's assassination. And, and um, Johnson implemented a number of programs in what he called the Great Society to try to eradicate poverty. And for a number of reasons, of course, they weren't successful. Um, and uh, conservatives today will point to the Johnson programs, the, the uh, Great Society programs, as an example of uh, big government run amok um, that point to that and say that big government isn't the answer to these kinds of problems. Um, my contention would be that big government can be the answer to these problems if it's run and administered properly, if poverty is understood correctly, um, and if, if um, efforts are made to ensure that um, the, the intent of the programs are actually fulfilled by those who carry it out. There were a lot of problems with the, um, the Great Society programs uh, that they really didn't have to do with the theory behind the intervention. It had to do with how the intervention was carried out. But in any event, even though Lyndon Johnson appointed this commission, it's my understanding that he ever, never actually accepted the report. Uh, and, uh, but nonetheless, this is what the report indicated, that the, the social and economic structure guarantees poverty. And, and what this means is, is that really to eliminate poverty, you have to look at changing the economic structure of our society. When you start talking about um, toying with capitalism, you know, you begin to uh, move into some very, very sensitive areas in, in individuals thinking and probably has a lot to do with why nothing really has resulted from this particular commission's report. The Horatio Alger myth is the belief that anyone really can get ahead if he only tries hard enough or she only works hard enough. This is really, if you've ever read The Jungle, this is what Jurgis Ruckus believed, um, that if he only worked hard enough, he'd be able to provide for his family, and he found out very differently. Um, but this myth encourages persons to strive to do better, and it's a good thing in American, but it also deflects the blame for the failure uh, of society in, in the area of economic security for families, food security for families, um, 
shifts it from the society to the individual because of this myth, this idea that if we work hard enough, everyone can succeed. We blame the individual for poverty instead of looking at the, the structural causes behind it, the things that really set up poverty and make it something that no individual can really change. Working class Americans have the chance to attain a higher position in the economic system, but Americans who are born to higher status parents have a greater chance of, of, well, not even attaining it, but inheriting the advantaged position without doing anything to achieve their status. Again, re, uh, look at that uh, film Born Rich that I referred to last week, because uh, Jamie Johnson tells you this himself in this movie. So with that in mind, can we really believe that the American dream of reward for individual effort, that Horatio Alger myth, is, is a reality? Or is it a reality for only some individuals? I'll leave you with that question as I close out this week's lecture for you. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll talk with you again next week.